Hey, everybody, it is Trags Mike Petralia back with this week's episode of the Jungle Roar podcast, powered by CLNS Media and FanDuel Sportsbook, the official wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Back with me on this, let's call it the glass half full, half empty episode of the Jungle Roar pod. And I'll explain what I mean after I welcome in Paul Daner Jr. of The Athletic, doing an outstanding job covering the Bengals. What year again is this for me? Refresh my memory, Paul. Do you know? Uh, well, it's 14. That's outstanding. 14th season. Yes, it's been a long, seen it all at this point, I think. Yes, you have. Um, <laughs> well, thanks for joining me, Paul. Uh, and, yeah, what's going on? And before we begin, I need a shout out here. I need to shout out to uh, John Rodenberg and the Indian Hill Braves for pulling mm. off uh, one of their biggest wins in school history. Uh, 21 to 3 last Friday at uh, Wyoming. I'd like to thank Brian Phelps, the athletic director at Indian Hill, for making me the skyline. Oh, <laughs> what a moment. What a moment. You know, finally, finally <laughs> getting what you deserve. You know, you were. You're there through thick and thin. You're, were you, you're, now, uh, you were long gone from Moeller. Uh, by the time John Rodenberg got there, right? John Rodenberg, yes, absolutely. John Rodenberg, though, delivered a uh, state championship for Moeller High School. Yes, he did. That's why I'm bringing this up. And he is also, yes. of course, the high school head coach of one Sam Hubbard. Um, That's great. Let's, speaking of Sam Hubbard, uh, let's start with the glass half full. Yeah. And I, so we're just, talking defense. Yeah. Yes, we are talking <laughs> defense. You know how I am always. A beacon so positive. Positivity. Yeah, so positive. Yes. Up, yeah. <laughs> um, the defense stepped up in a huge, huge way at the end of the game on Sunday. And Lou Anarumo, I thought, did a great job of describing that uh, to us on Monday before we all uh, departed for the bye week. And you did a terrific job, as you always do, uh, capturing his words, the significance. Explain to us. Paul Daner Jr., what he meant by the core four stepping up and his message to that group at the end of the game. Well, they they make $61 million this year. <laughs> the, the defensive line is the third highest paid defensive line in football. I mean, people talk a lot about the money on the other side of the ball. Yes. You know, where this team has invested has you know, they made DJ Reader the highest paid nose tackle in football when they signed him. They extended Sam Hubbard. They extended BJ Hill. They extended and paid Trey Hendrickson. I mean, they've invested draft picks. That is who they want to be. Yep. They want to be a team where the defensive line can wreck the game. And, you know, for many, at many points in the last couple of years, they have been that. Um, and this is one of the first times we've really seen it this year. I, Trey Hendrickson's had a tremendous year, but this was where the everybody eats game is really so much of, of what makes them really dynamic is, is when everybody's get has a hand in it. Everybody's got a pressure. The line doesn't know what to do or where it's coming from. And, and that's what this, this was, and, and that investment in, in those guys, um, you know, and and Lou saying, I, I came to him at the end and said, you, you, you're not coming out. You're winning the game for us. It doesn't matter if anybody's going to have it left in the tank. It's going to be them. And they pride themselves on that. And, you know, they have, you know, Sam Hubbard hardly came off the field all day. He And I can't imagine he would want to considering the way he was just waxing the right tackle. It's like, Hey, it's, it's a, it's a stat pattern today, you know, every time he was out there. So, but those guys being able to dominate is really at the core, not just of core four, but at the core of their defense of who they want to be and, and, and what they want to be. And it appeared for all the world that when Sam Hubbard sacked Geno Smith, um, on with about uh, just about over two minutes to go, the the last play before the two minute warning, it appeared to a lot of people like, oh, big exhale. That was all they needed. The offense is capable of getting for one for goodness sakes one first down, putting this game out of reach. Oops, and that's when Lou Anarumo had to go 
to that group of players because yeah. I think it was it would only be human nature, Paul, right, for uh, that group of guys that just exerted at 110 percent, if that's possible, uh, to get to the quarterback, make it tough, and they got him out of there on downs. And they figured, okay, this is Burrow's offense. Burrow's back to feeling healthy. They can get one first down, game over. And that's when Lou had to go to him. Yeah, and and that's, you know, really, and not just them, but everybody, is why kind of my takeaway after the game was, okay, the Bengals' defense found itself because they are at their best when you're at that exhaustive point, when, when, when there's – you just need one more play, one stop back against the wall. They've always been at their best. You know, before this season, my I wrote, I was kind of trying to think of what how I wanted to encapsulate, you know, what the Bengals defense has been, because it's been really remarkable in that it's been, you know, greater than the sum of its parts. And it does hasn't been star driven necessarily. But yet they've always seemed to find a way to finish in that top 10 and 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 in, in points per drive and mm-hmm. and really be efficient that way. It was, how, how are they doing it? You know, they they're middle of the pack in most of your major categories, to be honest. I mean, yards and a lot of the, the metrics that you look at, except in goal to go in goal to go and red zone. They have been unbelievable, particularly after halftime. And and the stat that I found was the previous last two years in 21 and 22 leading into this season, in goal to go situations after halftime, they were 21% better than everyone else in football That's at getting stunning. a stop. It's there are no stats in this league where a team is 21% better than the rest of the league in anything because it's so parody driven. And that's, and that's if I started throwing rando stats at you, not stats that decide wins and losses. And my question really part of the piece was, is this sustainable? Right. I mean, they've done it now. They've been in the top five, three years in a row in goal to goal defense. Okay. That includes, you know, the team before the 21 team came together, but there's just something about Lou down there is really good at keeping them off balance. The investment in the defensive line makes such a difference where you can't get run on and their ability to really have a lot of very smart, savvy, instinctual players that are really good in those with schemes and tight windows and, and creep keeping the quarterback off balance down there too. And it's been unbelievable. And that's why I felt like Sunday they found themselves because they hadn't been that really this year to Mm -hmm. this point, teams were pushing it in on them and they really hadn't looked stingy there. And it started to make me wonder, is the thesis wrong? Is there not sustainability in this? And then a day like Sunday comes and you see it is like, okay, Maybe this defense is now back to who they want to be because that's kind of who they've been. Well, what's interesting about that, Paul, and we asked Lou Anarumo this on Monday, the first drive of the game against the Seahawks was not good. And he's even like, I I don't know. Uh, (laughs) I don't know what I'm watching here. (laughs) And then they get into the low red zone and you figure, well, maybe they can catch a break there. And then there's a penalty, I believe it was, that set the Seahawks up first and goal. Uh, at the one and, you know, it was uh, Kenneth Walker in for the touchdown, but you know, the way the game started and the way the game finished two different scenarios. And that to me is the sign of a really, really good team is they can make in-game adjustments. They don't let what's happening at the uh, start of the game dictate what's going to happen at the end when the game's decided. Yeah. I feel like we see this a lot and we saw it on the offensive side of the ball, which we'll get to. And that is, you know, you can have games where you come out, you have a game plan that you think's going to work and they do too. And they win. And it's just, and you go back to the sideline and you say, okay, here's what they're doing. All right. Let's adjust to this and this and this and go forward and, and see what it looks like for me. I mean, how many times you see a game where a team goes up seven and nothing or 10 to nothing or whatever, and then they don't do anything the rest of the game. Cause the, the defense quickly looks at it figures out what they're doing. Oh, okay. And, and then they, they're able to approach right. it and get stops. And and I think that's, that's been really a, a big part of Lou Anarumo's defense for a while. Now the, the after halftime stats, that are incredible. How few touchdowns they've allowed after the break, once they get a real feel and, and can go into the second half and have their, you know, because he has such versatility in his personnel and such 
you know, he's so good at going to different pieces of the playbook as a coordinator and saving big calls. You know, he talked, Sam Hubbard talked about that, saving certain pass rush moves, throwing a change up. He did that with his third down call, saving big third down calls that he knows are going to work or thinks are going to work for later in the game and bigger spots. And, and you see that, that play, I think that's a big part of who they are too. And that's, that's what good defenses do and what they look like. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. And the app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash Boston and kick off the NFL season. One more time, that's FanDuel.com slash Boston. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. And if you remember back in 2021, the two games that stick out to me when you're talking about that uh, defensive adjustments are the two games against the Chiefs. Uh, when... Yeah. Yeah. Patrick Mahomes was like lighting them up in the first half um, at Paycor and the Bengals found a way to come back and win that game, win the division uh, that. And then again, of course, uh, in the AFC championship, they get the huge stop right before halftime. Speaking of goal to go. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Patrick Mahomes can't do anything against them in the second half. Those are the two games where I first really thought that Lou Anarumo can do things in the second half and, like you say, change things up. The other thing that stuck out to me uh, about Sunday's game is the improved tackling. He uh, told us on Monday that they only counted five missed tackles, which was the best tackling performance by the Bengals this year. And one more thing I want to, uh, you know, one more positive aspect of Sunday's game I want to address is Cam Taylor Britt. Not necessarily his play, but his attitude, because when you're going up against a guy like DK Metcalf, you get shoved to the ground. You're and, and we asked Lou this. Is that an indication that Cam was doing a great job getting in the grill and disrupting DK Metcalf? And his answer was, Paul. Yes. Yes, he, he was. <laughs> and, and he laughed. And you don't often see. <laughs> Sorry about the dramatic effect. It's there, okay. I, I appreciate to give it. You, I, it was. Yes. Yeah. I was trying to tee one up for you for 300 yards down the fairway, but oh, well. Um, no, but the, the <laughs> point there is Lou smiled and laughed. And he's yeah. like, and he had that 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 kind of laugh that show that shows his personality and his pride in a guy like Cam, who you know he's not the tallest guy, but he is a true true competitor on, on the corner, and that's obviously what you need in the NFL. Yeah, real big and physical. But the I mean, to me though, why I thought it was a big day for the you know the long term arc of Cam Taylor Britt was, you know, it's I always look at one of the first times that your coordinator gives you a special assignment, right? Mm. Obviously you're going to pair Cam Taylor Britt against DK Metcalf compared to the much more slight DJ Turner, you know, uh, over that's an obvious matchup that you want to do, but it's still, it's Cam, you got to follow DK around and you got to be responsible for stopping him. He's going to try to bully you. You got to bully him back. This one's on you. That's what you say to cornerback one. Mm. All right, that's 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 the type of thing that you say to somebody that you're counting on to be a guy. Go stop this dude and let us forget about it, and the other rest, the ten of us, will take care of everything else. And for him to take on that assignment, do as well as he did, frustrate DK, get an interception, and and have that big of a game, and oh by the way, be able to adjust on the fly to maybe the biggest play of the game, having to go up against Tyler Lockett. And understanding what he saw on film during the week of them trying to run this comeback to the pylon with Lockett, knowing that he would try to dance at him and then run the comeback and being sitting on it and being all over it and getting a massive PBU that again, basically wins them the game in the big picture, uh, you know, showing that versatility on top of the individual assignment. It's just a big day for him and and one where everyone's been waiting. What did we do during camp, right? 
Cam versus Jamar. This is going to help Cam become that next level, see that next level. And, and, and he was winning some of those battles. And now that's what it looks like. That That is why. That's what cornerback one looks like. It's a guy who can go out there against elite receivers uh, and not just hold his own, but have a specific matchup and make plays all over the field. All right. That's the positive. As, uh, positive Can we get negative part. already? I'm sick of this, like, the, like say niceties. The positive part of the Jungle War podcast for week number six it's has come to include it. Yeah. <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> what in the world is going on with the offense? Brian yeah. Callahan said he went home on Sunday night after the game with his iPad, sat on the couch. He was fuming. And I think he was. And he had every right to be. Do you know, Paul, and I'm uh, writing this for CLNS Media on Tuesday afternoon, do you know how many yards and how many possessions they had after halftime? Oh, the exact number? What was it? Ballpark. I mean, it was what? Yeah, it was. They had six possessions. 50-something? 50, 50 You're very close. 53 yeah. yards, 53, not including yeah. the yard kneel down at the end. Yeah. They had four first downs after halftime. Mm -hmm. and it, when you look at those numbers, I'd be fuming too if I were Brian Callahan and I had a, let's call him pretty much right now, healthy Joe Burrow, okay, being oh, yeah. able to do everything he needed to do Sunday physically. There's no question he did not have any limitations, at least the way he played. Mm -hmm. Having Jamar Chase and then yeah, T. Higgins was dinged up, but he did dress and he did play. Tyler Boyd, Joe Mixon, they just disappeared offensively and that is concern yeah because before it was easy to you know excuse away it was easy to well, look right. you see the quarterback can't move calf and and limitations and, and all of that was real and then you have arizona where you're like okay there there it is now it's coming around he's healthy there yeah, that's what it's supposed to look like and you have the first two drives against seattle and you're thinking okay but the 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 point was this team with that level of health now, you know, the quarterback being full go should never ever have a run of three quarters of complete ineptitude. There's just no way. And it's not just that they had, you know, four first downs or 53 yards. It's the way it looked. Joe Burrow looked bad. He, he was doing things that you just never see. I mean, missing layups. I mean, pitch and catch stuff that I feel like I've seen him do in his sleep and literally seen do on one leg before. Uh, and, and it's like you're talking about stuff that he just never misses. And, and inc including, you know, timing off with Jamar Chase, timing off with Tyler Boyd, throwing you know the third and four where Boyd runs to the line and the throw comes in low near his feet and he has to dive four and they don't get the first down um the, the easy curl back to Jamar Chase where it's just off I mean hits a guy in the helmet when Jamar's run I mean all of this stuff is just not Joe Burrow and it's so weird to to see that and why it's happening you know I I use the word exasperated stuck out to me about Brian Callahan yesterday He's like, he's a guy who's honestly sick of yelling about it. Like, he was just like, oh, I just, I don't even know what to say. I, I've said it so many times. He's so mad. He was, he, he went from mad to just like, ugh, you know? And so, because that doesn't make any sense. So much of this doesn't make sense. I think a big problem you have right now, the, to me, the core of this is there is a lack of trust beyond Jamar Chase. Right. With Joe Burrow and everything. OK, and that's that's he, he he only want to look at the tight end position. He has no desire and even throw throwing a single ball in the direction of a tight end Irv Smith or otherwise. Um, he doesn't want to check it down. He doesn't feel much confidence in checking it down to anybody to mix in or if Chase okay. Brown's in there. Let for me stop you right there. Snaps. Why yeah. is that? That seems like such a simple because they're not making plays. Because they're they're producing nothing. They're not. He's not breaking a tackle. Teams are sitting on it and looking for it and tackling the guy for nothing. So I I, I was kind of breaking down some of his target percentages, um, his rates this year. 
He is 77% of targets to wide receivers, which is 5% more than anybody else in the league, which isn't necessarily insane when you consider his receivers and they've gone a lot of 10 personnel and adding Trent Irwin on the field or not. Um, but still, it's a lot a big number. 10% to tight ends and 13 to running backs. Last year, 62% to receivers, 15 to tight ends, and 23% to running backs. When when you have two dead spots that the defense is not worried about you throwing to on the field, it puts extra attention on those receivers. It makes the windows tighter. It forces timing to be different because there's there because of that attention and everything feels off. They have Jamar Chase and very little other trust. I mean, they've they've struggled to get Tyler Boyd invo- involved. T. Higgins for numerous reasons. Uh, has not had anywhere near the season they need him to have to this point. And they have they have no other real answers. And so much of that, I feel like, is at its core. I don't know the Burrow's really trusting everything. I think that showed up in some of his throws and in some of his decisions. And that's something that they've got to get worked out ASAP. How can they get the run game or the short pass game that resembles a run game going? I think there's a couple of things um, and and I'm not here saying this is going to change their season, but I do think these are, these are easily accessible tweaks uh, that you can get to um, chase Brown has to play more. Joe Mixon is taking on too much workload. He's tired. Right. Um, he's, he's doesn't have, I mean, he had some juice the first couple of weeks and I feel like we don't really see that. He had a long of five the other day. I mean, that's the, that's the shortest long in the Zach Taylor era. I mean, it's insane. His success rate is down 33% now. It was 39 last year. Um, it's You're just not getting much. I, there needs to be trust built with Chase Brown. Clearly, that hasn't existed. But at a certain point, throw him in the fire and see if you can get a little more explosion. You know, I feel like with Mixon, you're going to get a guy that's going to lower the shoulder. He's going to drop a guy in the ground. He's going to get you four and no more, right? It, uh, Callahan said it yesterday. We get what's blocked, right? Like, and that Correct. is the ultimate indictment on the running back. It's fine to get what's blocked. That's great, but you need explosiveness. They talked all offseason about needing more explosiveness in the running game. You drafted a guy, give him a chance to go show some explosiveness, and that can show up catching the ball on, on some early downs as well. And I think the same thing can be said at tight end. There's just no trust in Irv Smith. There seemed to be some trust in Tanner Hudson. So maybe getting him as the tight end that you have involved a little bit more often or going to more 10 personnel where you have four receivers out there is an answer for you to have an option that can feel more feasible underneath that that Joe's a little more willing to throw to because it ain't her right now you asked Zach Taylor on Monday to specifically address the tight end position and whether or not Tanner Hudson might challenge Irv Smith did you read anything into Zach's answer and the fact that he really didn't mention Irv by name? Yeah, in his answer? it was good knowing you, Irv. I mean, that was <laughs> that was two things were said. Uh, one of them was how much they how highly they think of their practice squad players and that those guys can be real players. And two, I'm good. not going to say. And two, I'm not going to say Irv Smith's name. So if you want to know where the feelings sit on that and an easy tweak that you can make, the problem that you get to with that though, Mike, is. One, I, it's a Tanner for Irv switch because Sample and Wilcox's role are on special teams and, and, and are important, and they're they're who they are with your run game stuff. Right. Like those those are the roles. Your switch is Irv Smith and Tanner Hudson, and now that is probably one you need to make. What are you going to do? Are you going to, you're going to pull Tanner up or are you keeping four tight ends? you I mean, you can't have four tight ends active. Really. There's a lot of weird roster gymnastics. You got to think about there, but it, it's hard to really sell me that, that you're going to have comfort with him after, you know, the bye week right now with you, you look at what it's been. I, I, I can't, I can't buy that. One more issue on the run game. To me, and I know, and you mentioned it just a couple of minutes ago, about the explosiveness of it. Forget the explosiveness. If I'm a Bengal fan, I just want the Bengals to get a yard when they need a yard. Like the third and one to open the fourth quarter on Sunday. You get that one yard and you extend the drive. You get 
a couple of yards uh, on the last drive of the fourth quarter, you end the game. They can't, they're they not capable of getting short yardage. And I think Callahan addressed this on Monday as well. Their ability in short yardage situation, sh- short yardage situations has been abysmal. Yeah, you, you, absolutely. I feel like it's, it feels like it's a problem every year. You it know, uh, jo, jo, uh, Joe Mixon did a decent job last year of having a decent, uh, uh, a high efficiency rate in some of those short yardage runs. There weren't a ton of them, but um, he had a decent rate. And and Joe Burrow has done a decent job in his career of being good with QB sneaks. And a lot of times you'll see Joe get cute and do a second, a second one sneak that they don't see coming to avoid the attention on it. Like you see on third and one to extend drives. You never even get to third and one. Right. And, and so some of those things I think are fix the sneaks, particular being an option, help you out. Um, But you're right. I mean, it's, it's a matter of just being able to move people. I mean, if, if you're going to compile a line full of all these massive humans, <laughs> right. If you're, you're going to be big, powerful downhill run people mover, like as your run game, you better move people. Okay. Because otherwise get an athletic group that can go well, side that's to the side. Whole, that's what I don't understand. Paul is people want to kill Cordell Vols and he gave up another turnstile sack uh, on Sunday. Yeah. But, Give him a chance to block forward. Give him a chance to get downhill. He's a huge human being. All we heard in uh, the summer, in the spring, and in the summer was how the left side of the offensive line is going to block out the sun with Orlando Brown Jr. and Cordell Volson. Correct? We heard that all the time. How Absolutely. And how have they made uh, taken advantage of it? They haven't. Yeah. And, And in part because it comes down to the scheme. They don't get under center. They don't run. And maybe, and and Callahan did allude to this and hint at it on Monday, maybe they get under center more after the bye week and and find some way to get some momentum with the run game. Yeah, early in the year, you know, when we were kind of writing a lot about the limitations for their offense, I, I was going back and looking at their under center percentages. And they were like 13 to 15 times a game. Some of it was short yardage. But they still did... They had it in their pocket and teams had to prepare for it and, and give them some time to do something different. And I think having that back in their pocket coming out of the buy can help, you know, when they would go, it felt like when they would have games where they were struggling offensively, all of a sudden they'd have a drive where they'd come out in 13 personnel under center and run it a bunch with, with, and, and have some, it would help open up some things and they haven't really been able to go to that. And, and that can help too, just a little bit. But I'm with you. I, I I think you'd like to see them do a little more downhill behind Brown and Volson, and, and let those guys push a little bit, um, a little more play action, a little more under center. I think can vary their run game and not be as predictable as as it can be. I still think inevitably at their core they're gonna be shotgun run downhill gap. But I do think they they need to have more variance, which they've lacked because of Burrow's mobility. What are you working on? Anything during the bye week? Are you taking a well-deserved break? Well, this, I mean, I think a real dive into what what can change offensively and the realistic possibilities of what's most likely to change. You know, I we can sit here and 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 people can talk and talk about uh guys that could be trade bait from other teams, but the reality is that's highly unlikely that the Bengals will change their stripes and do that. It's just right. not who they are or who they seem to have any idea of wanting to be. Um I I, I think that's a fail on their part in, in in a franchise that has broken the mold so often in so many areas. It's the one they seem to be holding on to. And I think it could be one that really hurts them this year where they have two easily accessible spots in the backup running back in the tight end position that you don't have to give up a bunch to acquire something. for the the, the P Ryan thing is just too easy at this point. I mean, he's getting two touches in Denver. He's third on the pecking order. He doesn't, he has, a two-year contract of which is non-guaranteed in the second year next year. It's like talking about a million plus dollars you have to pay to him this season to try to bring him back here for a late round pick swap. And 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 an unwillingness to do that to me is short-sighted and can cost them where they clearly have a massive hole there 
in, in, in an important position, not just to hand the ball to, but in how solid he is in protection and, and reliable. And again, back to the core issue here, trust. I mean, Joe Burrow really trusted Shamaj P. Ryan to protect and to throw a check down to and make some guys miss. And, and, and that was part of why he worked so well. And I, I think, uh, you know, an inability of a, of, uh, to sacrifice a future late round pick to try to win now is 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 short sighted and could cost them. I hope not, but that's that's the type of stuff I think you know we're we're tapping into right now is how realistic are the changes and how big they could be. Well, I am going to get away uh, for a couple of days, recharge my batteries, come back bright eyed and bushy tailed and optimistic yeah. as I always am. You, <laughs> you're used to me as an optimist. Yeah, I was going to say I, I'm looking to forward to around. all the bright eyed, bushy tailed. Yeah, that's what I was just. That's what I. You know, people ask me about, well, what's Trags like, and I'm like, I always start with bright eyed and bushy tailed. It's yeah, my sure it's you my, do. It's my, it's my beginning. It's my beginning line. And I might, uh, my my take in a high school game or two so we'll see what happens can you be are you allowed to win fan of the game twice uh i, I don't Is there know any I don't, rules? i'd have to call up skyline and check out the rules uh yeah on said participation in that regard yeah i don't know maybe maybe you could get maybe you could get james rapine to come with you to a game maybe he could be fan of the game next time and you guys could share the honors you know i don't think i'd have to twist his arm no <laughs> <laughs> do, do you do you think i'd have to twist that hard or skyline in high school football no i don't think you'd have to try hard to twist his I arm, do not. well i want to wish you paul a very happy bye week and you too enjoy uh, time with the family you certainly earned it uh we will be back next week and uh, looking ahead to the san francisco 49ers as the bengals look to get above 500 but it'll be one of their stiffest tests of the year no question about that against uh, a Kyle Shanahan coach team out at Levi's Stadium that'll be on October 29th hope everyone has a wonderful and restful bye week this week for Paul Daner Jr. be sure to follow him on Twitter I'm Mike Petralia Trags keep that jungle roaring the CLNS Media Network is powered by FanDuel sign up at FanDuel.com slash Boston and get in on the action with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose.